Well, I think there could be put more attention to, to people coming into the herd, that they should at least have a vaccination against influenza, and uh, also that you should not have workers inside the herds who have uh, symptoms of respiratory disease. Because it is uh, it's, uh, really a big problem if we get one of these human seasonal strains into the herd, because there is no immunity whatsoever in the swine herds. Hello. Welcome to this podcast in the Meet the Experts series on practical health, pig health management brought to you by Beringer Ingelheim. My name is Peter Bess. In this episode of the Meet the Experts series, our topic is the influenza A virus in pigs. To help us, I'm joined by Dr. Pia Ruth Hansen of the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Dr. Ruth Hansen, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm always happy to get the opportunity to talk about my favorite virus. <laughs> well, we certainly have that today. You're a veterinarian and a virologist, is that right? Yes, that's correct. I did my master's degree in veterinary science and uh, half a year ago, I finished my PhD in veterinary virology. Oh, congratulations, so, uh, delighted. And why is Influenza virus, A virus, or IAV, if we can shorten it. Um, why is that your favorite virus? Well, I think it's a very interesting virus because it has a very unique genome that is uh, segmented. And um, on top of that, it's also an RNA virus, so it has a very special evolution. And uh, we have a constant generation of novel strains and subtypes. And on top of that is also a sonotic pathogen, which makes it interesting, I guess. Indeed. And across uh, both swine med medicine and human medicine, it's a, a particular topic, yes. So is it an area of swine veterinary med medicine that's still developing in ways that affect practical pig health management? It definitely is. Just the last uh, 10 years, I guess, our overall perception of influenza virus in swine has changed quite a lot because we realized that uh, probably due to the change in, in the production system that the virus is now persistently infecting the herd and we don't see just these episodic outbreaks. So it's endemically present all year round. It's an ever-present all year round, not just episodes, not seasonal. Not seasonal. No, we can find mm. it all year. Good. Before we talk more about that in a minute, please, can we first just remind our listeners of some of the background to the virus? As far as I know, this virus causing clinical influenza in pigs has been characterized as influenza A since about 1940, so for about 80 years now. Why do we call it influenza A? Yeah, so actually, influenza virus was first described in swine all the way back to the Spanish flu, but it was not until the 30s that it was actually isolated as being the, the pathogen behind the disease. And the reason we call it influenza A is because we have four different influenza types, A, B, C, and D, and they are anti-genetically different. So the antibodies towards one does not protect against the other. So that's a reason to divide them. And also they have different host uh, spectra. So uh, yeah, and different clinical uh, outcomes. So A is significant in pigs and the others, B, C, and D are not significant in pigs. They're not as significant, let's say. Influenza A uh -huh. is the most important for pigs. The other one has just been isolated for pigs, but uh, don't cause uh, very uh, very many symptoms. And, and still continuing in the background, uh, influenza viruses seem to originate most often in waterfowl. Have reservoirs of infection in the form of intermediate hosts also been in, identified concerning infection in pigs? Well, uh, there has been some old studies from the 40s where they have seen that uh, that the lungworm of the pig can also transmit the virus, but it's not uh, an important uh, reservoir. So it's it can happen, but it doesn't need to have an intermediate host. But when we talk about intermediate host, I think that uh, pig is actually interesting in itself because it's an intermediate host or it's believed to be an intermediate host for influenza infection in humans because they have uh, been uh, 
yeah, or they are able to get infected with both avian and human influenza viruses, and thereby novel reassortants can appear. Ah, so the relationships between so-called swine flu and human influenza not only have implications in human health, but they're also relevant in the continuing evolution of the IAV virus. It is indeed, and I guess you cannot describe the evolution of swine influenza viruses without also looking into the human influenza viruses because they are uh, continuously transmitted into to the herds and uh, and yeah, uh, representing some of the most important strain that we have now today. Yeah. Uh the, because of the many reassortments of the virus over time, we've learned to classify subtypes according to surface proteins, HA and NA. Uh, do we know how many of these subtypes cause disease in pigs? Are there many HN variants which are, which are pathogenic in pigs? Well, so you can say overall that we have three uh, different subtypes that can infect almost uh, commonly infect fix, and they are H1N1, H1N2, and H3N2. Uh, but on top of that, we have under each uh, subtype, we also have different lineages, uh, which uh, depends on where the virus originated from. So it can be an, of avian origin or human origin. And those lineages uh, also don't have a great amount of cross protection between them. So we also classify them as subtypes. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a wide spectrum, then, isn't it, that you're dealing with? It is a very wide spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Now you've been looking at the IAV special situation, especially in Denmark. I imagine. To what extent is the virus present in Danish wine herds, and have you seen changes in the subtypes involved? So in Denmark, just like in most countries in the world where we have extensive uh, swine production. Uh, Influenza is very prevalent, and uh, 10 years ago, we did a study for looking for influenza A antibodies in the Danish uh, sow herds, and actually 90% of them were positive, so meaning that they have met influenza at one point in their life. And on top of that, in Denmark, we have a very good uh, annual uh, surveillance program, a passive surveillance program, where we receive samples from pigs experiencing respiratory disease. And in these, uh, we find influenza as the most uh, common pathogen. Uh, and just this year, it was 54% uh, of the cases. So it is a very important pathogen in Denmark as well as in other countries. Indeed. And is there evidence in Denmark that the different subtypes are associated with differences in the severity of clinical signs? Well, not really. Um, I think that uh, we haven't been able to say that one subtype is more pathogenic than another. Uh, I think it's more dependent than, uh, or it's more dependent on how the pre-existing immunity is in the herd. So if the herd has never made an H3 and 2 virus before, then you will feel like the symptoms are more severe, but it's due to the immunity, not to the virus itself. And then you have also mm. seen some markers, uh, molecular markers in the virus, but those are more related to the internal genes so far. So they are not dependent on the subtype, let's say. I'm with you. Uh, are the immune responses themselves uh, different in degree, degree for each subtype? You know, the amount of antibody that's created and its neutralizing effect? I guess the antibody or the immunity response is more or less similar among subtypes. Of course, you can have some variation, but in general, it's dominated by these neutralizing antibodies towards the HA gene of the virus. Hmm. Let's talk specifically about your own work, Pia, with, with IAV. So is it the uh, genetic diversity of IAV or what area are you looking at uh, in terms of uh, your current research, please. Yeah, I, I've been looking a lot into the genetic diversity of influenza. So we, for example, tried to follow one herd uh, over a full year and see how much the, the virus drift. And we actually saw that it drifted or mutated even more than the human seasonal influenza. Hmm. A surprise to you. It was uh, quite a surprise. It has not been seen before. So you thought, or the general perception before was that 
the influenza virus in swine does not mutate as much because the swine don't live that long. Um, and also because the pressure, uh, the immunity pressure might be different, but it seems that it's, it's actually not. And now that we have this endemic infection where the virus is constantly present, it gives the optimal environment for this uh, selection pressure or the antibodies driving the virus to change because it wants to avoid uh, the host immunity. So it makes sense. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed. This herd you've been monitoring, then, uh, was it chosen for a reason it's representative in some way, or is, is its experience likely to be uh, indicative of what happens in other herds? Uh, it is a normal uh, sow herd. That the, the special thing about it was that it didn't have any other respiratory pathogens, as far as we know. So in that way, we could look limited on influenza A virus, and also it had its own uh, it uh, had its own breeding stock. So we didn't have any new subtypes coming in from the outside, which can be a problem in other herds. But uh, but I guess there are also quite a lot of these these herds that have their own breeding stock. So in that way, it is representative. And it was vaccinating? It was not vaccinating. So this is uh, just based on natural antibodies right. driving okay. the evolution. Yeah. Yes. And this uh, business of being a year-round infection, um, do you think this is a change in the nature of the virus in recent years, that it's now a, a persistent year-round? No, I believe that is not uh, something that is uh, connected to the virus, but more to the production system that we have that are getting more and more extensive nowadays. So we have uh, weekly uh, uh, naive piglets being born, which are susceptible to disease, and therefore you can have the infection going on for years. So our production systems are the engine that drives the, the persistence of the virus, uh, of like the infection it, yeah. in the herd. Yes, and that's once it's in the herd by external means, guilts or whatever, then the herd itself will keep it going in that way. Um, is the success of vaccination where practice, has that been compromised by the evolution of the virus? I guess it's uh, it's been more complicated, to, or it is now more complicated to control influenza. Uh, because it is present all year round and also because the evolution now is, it seems like it is pretty massive. So if we expect that the vaccine uh, only cover the subtype that is included in the vaccine and the one that are very similar to that, um, then we could have a problem when they start drifting far away from the vaccine string. However, we don't have any studies to prove that yet. And an advantage that the vaccine has compared to the natural immunity is that we include also these uh, adjuvants, which gives a broader immune response. So that could also help, let's say. And, uh, but at least uh, we have proven uh, in a study of my PhD as well, that, um, that you can have uh, no cross protection within uh, strains of the same lineage. So if that is true also in case of vaccine, then we, we do have a problem because our strains in the European vaccines are currently 20 years old. Hmm. So there could be a need of revising what we're doing in that area then. It could be, but it's also difficult because uh, it seems like each herd are having a evolution in a different direction. So how do you choose the new vaccine strain? Yes. Yes. And this evolution, is it, I, I, I refer to genetic diversity, is it, I never know the difference between genetic diversity and antigenic diversity, forgive me. What are we talking about here? Yeah, so this is genetic diversity that we look most into. Uh, but we also did perform uh, some experiments looking into the antibody and their cross protection, and that's the antigenic diversity. And also Tim Harder from Germany, who has uh, done a study also on the genetic drift and related it to the anti-genetic drift as well. So how does these genetic changes affect the, 
the antibodies cross protection have seen that uh, that we now have a very huge difference within the same lineage that are what we call 11 antigenic units. It's a way of measuring how big the differences are antigenetically. And in humans, mm -hmm. normally we update the vaccine when there are four antigenic units apart. So it could indicate that we might have a have a problem. Hmm. Indeed. And you mentioned about the, the human swine inter interface as being, you know, having an effect on, on what's happening here. Uh, so that uh, obviously you can't control that human swine interface very largely. It's, it's going to be ongoing. Can you see any way of reacting to the potential role of that interface in, in the evolution that you're seeing in swine virus? Do you see any way of managing that so that it, it has less effect in future? Well, I think that could be put more attention to, to people coming into the herd, that they should at least have a vaccination against influenza, and uh, also that you should not have workers inside the herds who have uh, symptoms of respiratory disease, because it is uh, it's, uh, really a big problem if we get one of these human seasonal strains into the herd, because there is no immunity whatsoever in the swine herds now. So that could be one way of, of managing that. So you control your visitors, you insist that they have a flu jab, a, a <laughs> influenza vaccine, and anybody who's showing respiratory disease signs should be excluded. That includes the staff as well, no doubt. Yes, that would include the staff as well. Yeah. And d does it matter? Uh, I've no idea. Are flu uh, vaccines for humans all the same, or is there any need to be specific about that? Uh, well, they yearly update the human influenza vaccine. So in that way, in the same year, it will be the same vaccine for, for people. Thank you, Dr. Ruud Hansen. Uh, to our listeners, you have been listening to a Meet the Expert podcast brought to you by Beringer Ingelheim, in which we have been speaking to Dr. Pia Ruud Hansen of the University of Copenhagen in Denmark about influenza A virus in pig herds. This conversation with Dr. Ruud Hansen continues in a further podcast. So let me say both thank you for listening and please join us again.